The Death Worlders, a story by Hambone, Chapter 13, Tall Tales, Brick, New Jersey, Earth. The name I was given at birth was not in fact Ravinder Singh. You see, it often surprises me just how few Americans know that India is a nuclear power. We have our stockpiles of weapons, our enrichment program, our power plants. Any nation which has a nuclear arsenal and is prepared for the possibility of nuclear war inevitably needs to employ experts in the effects, both the immediate ones and those that linger, of nuclear weaponry. That was me. I was, once, one of my home country's foremost experts in just what the bomb does to people and to places. A curious vocation for a Buddhist, maybe. But I viewed my role as being that of peacekeeper, or maybe a guardian, keeping the doors of hell locked. Maybe if I could impress, seriously enough, just how terrible a thing these weapons are, make my nation's leaders see that nothing good could ever come of their deployment. That awful force might be kept in check. No matter. The point is, I am one of only a handful of people in the world who know in full the details of the Republic of India's nuclear program. You can see why my abduction would have caused alarm among the security and intelligence services, the military. The fact that my eventual return to Earth landed me in the USA could only serve to compound that sense of alarm. Hence my change of name and reclusiveness. You'll forgive me if I don't share my original identity. I doubt that India has forgotten me. But you, of course, are not here for the story of why I am living in brick. Are you, Mr. Jenkins? Three years and eight months after Vancouver. Cimbrian Colony. The Far Reaches. Oh, you should see her. She's getting so big. And we were all so proud of her when she played Mary for the Nativity last. Jennifer Delaney, mid-twenties, space babe, and feeling happy for the first time that she could remember to hear her mum's logaria. Tams and Delaney had launched into her usual update on the lives of literally every person within a ten-mile radius of their home, almost without preamble, as if it was just another daily message on her daughter's answer phone rather than a pre-recorded video letter to be sent into space after years of not even knowing if she was still alive or not. It was comforting in its way, normalcy amongst the weirdness. She hadn't changed a bit. Robert Delaney, on the other hand, had lost a huge amount of weight and lost the last color in his hair. He looked less amply jolly nowadays and more scholarly. It was quite a change, but Jen had to admit that the only other time she'd seen her old man look so good was in old pictures from the 80s. He seemed content to sit quietly, left arm around his chatterbox wife's shoulders and just listen with a faint smile. But just as Tamsin was launching into the chapter about non-family members, he rolled his eyes and held up a tablet computer he'd been holding out of sight behind the couch. Written on it large enough for the camera to see were the words, What she's trying to say is... He swiped down. I love you, and I miss you, and I pray every day that you're safe out there. He smiled, chin wobbling, and swiped down one last time. We both do. By the time Jen's eyes were dry again, by the time Jen's eyes were dry again, most of her mum's monologue was over, and she wound down with a few anecdotes about the daughter of somebody who had babysat Jen twenty years previously and of whom she had no memory, before glancing anxiously at somebody outside of the camera's field of view. Is that okay? I'm sure she'll love it, the operator assured her. Robert grinned at him from behind his wife's back. Well, be safe, darling. I come home soon. The video ended. Want to go home? Old Jen asked. No. She had been doing that more and more lately, talking to herself, carrying on a conversation between... Old Jen, the IT cubicle mouse whose sole experience with men had consisted of a few awkward and ill-advised office fumbles, and New Jen, the competent, confident, slightly cold and battle-scarred space babe. It had helped her get through months of isolation during the long walk, but the habit was ingrained now. Perhaps even more alarmingly, Old Jen seemed to have a voice of her own now, 
a shy, querulous voice that longed for safety, for warmth and comfort, to go back to her own bed and maybe a cat and a goldfish and shove her head under a pillow and forget. If she hadn't been a genuinely nice person, Jen suspected she would have hated herself. As it was, she accepted the voice of her own timidity for what it really was. Her past. And her past was a story of fear, weakness, lethargy, everything that kept a person back, kept them in a cubicle, kept them too afraid to talk to boys. Everybody had that voice. At least she knew when hers was talking. Still, sometimes it was all right to let old Jen cry, so long as she wiped away the tears and kept putting one foot in front of another. There was some shouting outside, which meant that Kirk had probably arrived. It was only his imminent arrival, along with the influx of colonists from Earth, including Jen's replacement, that had persuaded her to finally watch the video from her parents and read the messages from her friends and more distant relatives. After today, there would be no further opportunities. She just wasn't sure what she was going to do. She wasn't going back to Earth, that much was certain. And she couldn't stay here, even if her bath was here. And there was the awful question of keeping her head down and avoiding being noticed by the great hunt. But she'd figure it out. Starship Sanctuary. Cimbrian Local Space. The Far Reaches. I swear I don't know why you upgraded this thing to be so comfortable when we spend hardly any time inside it. It wasn't originally supposed to be just two of us, Julian. Right. Still can't believe the other 23 went back to Earth. Oh, they'll be back. I was wrong about something way back when. You'll have to tell me later, Kirk. Hurry up and get us landed. Long-range sensors are picking up an ALV drive signature. Looks big enough to be a frigate, or maybe even a cruiser. We want to be inside the colony's camouflage field when they get close enough to spot us. Just the one? A ship that big shouldn't be out this far. Shouldn't? Maybe. Is? Yes. Get us down there. Aye, aye. Cimbrian Colony. The Far Reaches. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. They're coming in pretty hard. The sanctuary was hammering down at the core of a trail of plasma. Powell and all the rest ducked down against a sudden blast of air, and the whole colony shook as the ship extended its fields pancaking the air below into a hundred-meter-tall cushion that shoved the fireball sideways, scything the top off some nearby trees. "'Jesus H. Titty fucking Christ!' Legsy yelled, a sentiment echoed in assorted vulgarities from all across the camp. Thrumming smugly, Sanctuary settled gently onto the landing field. "'The fuck was that all about? The fuck was that all about?' Powell demanded as the ramp dropped and Kirk's partner in crime, Julian, staggered out and sat down heavily. The camouflage field working? Franklin, come on the field! Powell yelled at the seal whose job was to handle the colony's force field. On it! The field shimmered, moving from optimal collection mode to a wide-effect digital camo that would, in theory, make the colony very difficult to see from orbit. Julian stood up. There's a ship. Julian stood up. There's a ship incoming, he explained. The trooper responsible for the colony's sensor array, really just the feed from a number of stealthy microsatellites in geosynchronous orbit, had already grabbed his gear before Powell could turn to shout him into action and was busy checking it. Confirmed, he called. One warp signature. Incoming at superluminal from out system. Looks like they're coming from Kelsey space. Powell released a frustrated grunt. Intel said the Alliance was stepping up anti-piracy ups in the sector. If it's the fucking Russians... He trailed off, not finishing the thought. If it was the Russians, then the whole Cimbrian operation might well be fucked. Moscow's aligning itself with the Kelsey had caused quite the political row back at home, where most everybody favored neutrality in the interstellar conflict. While the Alliance hadn't been responsible for the Sol quarantine, their condemnation of the enclosure had smacked more of expedient propaganda than actual moral outrage. They're slowing. Sublight, Baker added. Active ping! We just got scanned. Think they saw anything? Fields up, camo's running. At that range, if our gear's working as advertised, no, they didn't. Good. If this is just a patrol, hopefully they'll have a look and move on. Baker watched his screen for a good minute. They're not, he decided. Looks like they're pulling into low orbit. Set to sweep directly over us and... Ten mics. Shit. Okay. 
Get the Sky Master ready. Jen glanced at the imposing device in the heart of the camp. The Sky Master was a repurposed M242 Bushmaster mounted on a complicated gyroscopic base and field emitter array that transformed it into an effective ground to orbit weapon. It had been one of the first things the platoon had set up after the force field had come online. As she watched, it pivoted and swung skywards, aiming into the western sky. Nine mics, Baker warned. Powell nodded grimly. His face had that same cold, calculating look that Adrian had used to wear in moments of real danger. Prepare to active ping, he ordered. If we see any signs that they're hostile, we shoot first and the questions can go fuck themselves. Baker confirmed the order, then counted down. 8.30. Jen cleared her throat. You sure about this? She asked. Sure as I'll ever be. Baker, active ping. The sensors specialist nodded and tapped something on his equipment. He gritted his teeth at what he saw. Ah, shit. Their grav spikes up, he reported. Powell spun and addressed the two men manning the Skymaster. Gun team, five rounds, ASX. Five ASX, ready, lock. Fire. The Skymaster thumped. Jen felt it in her chest as the weapon opened a force field walled tube of vacuum in front of it, into which it fired a round which accelerated away on a warp pulse in line, which accelerated away on a warp pulse in a line of exotic blue radiation. The warp field would collapse scant millimeters from the target's hull, delivering the round long before the Kelsey cruiser could even register that it was under attack. In theory, if the cruiser's shields were still down while its warp field dissipated, the rounds would strike its hull unimpeded smashing through the fragile ceramic armor tiles and delivering shaped explosive charges directly to the superstructure. If its shields were up, in theory the gun could overwhelm them with sustained fire, but during that time the cruiser might lower its spike and flee, blowing Symbrian's cover. Baker's report soothed that particular worry. Target well hit and deorbiting, but they're still intact. Communications could still be up. Powell set his jaw. Five more. Fire for effect. Five more! Fire! The gun slammed into life again, and Jen felt her heart jump in her chest as five more rounds in as many seconds vanished skywards, pulsing upwards in a streak of blue light. Powell keyed his radio. Kirk, get ready to hit orbit and fuck off. If this all goes to shit, we need it reported back to Earth. Jen, you'd best go with him. Right. Take care of this place, Powell, Jen said, while old Jen whimpered objections at her about not abandoning everyone. You didn't even name this place, Powell objected. Folktha, Jen called as she ran. It's called Folktha. She jogged behind the slender alien as he cantered across the lawn and scrambled up the sanctuary's ramp. Julian had sprinted ahead and was already powering up the ship's kinetics as the door closed. We good to go? he asked. Kirk shook his head, a slow gesture on his long-necked kind. Not yet. That ship will see us if we take off right now, and its gravity spike is still up. They'll get a good look at us if we run now. We need to wait until it's below the horizon. And then? And then we go with Plan B, I suppose. I hope that's not the Plan B that I'm used to, old Jen muttered, sotto voce. Louder, she asked. What's Plan B? We deploy the system defense field we stole from the Confederacy, Julian told her. An expedient solution, but also a politically awkward one, Kirk expanded. It would damage Earth's reputation and bargaining position. I was instructed that the survival of the colony is more valuable, but... But the fewer pawns we sacrifice, the better, Julian finished. Jen blinked. Somebody stole one of those things for us? Julian did, Kirk said, a revelation which caused her to re-examine Julian. After his stammering embarrassment at finding her in the bath, she'd pegged him as another Dara and largely ignored him. Stupid of me, she realized, examining him with New Jen's eye for danger. That earnest, cautious expression had done a good job of hiding the fact that he was fit, strong, and scarred, and clearly a survivor. It was only the slightly pathetic reaction he had to being in the presence of her, of a woman, she realized, that had made her dismiss him. Had he been standing with more confidence, she would have had no trouble imagining him stealing hardware like that. At least it was a lesson learned harmlessly. What's going on out there anyway? She asked, changing the subject. Brick, New Jersey. Earth. Did you know? 
The Corti never dabbled in nuclear fission on anything more than an experimental basis. Three deaths and an event that came alarmingly close to being their own version of Pripyat later, and they abandoned the program and never spoke of it again. I found that interesting. Of course, that was before their eugenics program and after their intellect had expanded and their compassion had shriveled. They were well past the point of need to meddle with such comparatively crude science. The Kortai who abducted me. Do you meditate? You should. I was taken while meditating and did not even notice until I opened my eyes again. Their names were Hivek and Twanri, a mated couple and as close as the Kortai ever come to being head over heels in love. Nice enough people, if one overlooked their condescending habit of constantly attempting to impress upon the lesser species just how intellectually superior they were. I was not impressed. They had deliberately stolen me to tap me for expertise that they themselves lacked, after all. Oh, don't get me wrong. Corti schoolchildren will regard the class on radioisotope decay as mundane and boring, but there's a gulf of difference between academic understanding of what causes nuclear fission to happen and direct experience and knowledge of what the effects are when it happens uncontrolled. For that, they turn to the human race. We aren't the only known species to have detonated these weapons, nor to have dabbled in nuclear fission with the safeties off, but we are by far the most intelligent of those races which did so. That's probably why they spent so much time repeating their obvious mental advantages. Insecurity. They chose two of us, myself and Mikhail, a Ukrainian gentleman who offered guided tours of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and chose, it must be said, perfectly. You could not have asked for a better pair to give you a complete analysis on both the academic and practical consequences of the aftermath of a nuclear event, which of course gave us something of a hint as to what we were there to do. Adams had a secondary role besides manning the force field, namely communications, and he called out as something on his own gear beeped. They're hailing, he reported. Powell frowned. Can they escape now? Baker shook his head. No way. That ship's coming down hard. Fuck it. May as well hear the bastard's last will in fucking testament. Open the line. The voice that came through was clearly Australian and desperate. Attention, assholes! Please stop fucking shooting at us. We are not Alliance. I repeat, we are just a pack of poor fucking bastards in honest need of some goddamned help. There was a long, embarrassed pause among the soldiers. Then Powell leaned forward took hold of the microphone and replied, Attention ship, ceasing fire, you are to proceed as follows. Crouch down, tuck your head between your legs, and kiss your asses goodbye. Sorry. There was no response from the radio. The silence on the ground was eventually broken by Legsy. Fuck and helpful advice that, sir, he commented. Several of the men released the laughs they'd been holding back. Shut the fuck up and get the lads ready to abandon base if we have to, Powell ordered. Actually, fuck that. Where's it coming down? Baker scratched his head. She's aiming for that big lake to the east. The captain glanced at the sensor's screen, then grabbed his field binoculars and turned to face westwards, raising them to his face. Other heads turned to follow his aim. Some few seconds later, a cloud formation withered and died in the face of incredible heat as the Alliance cruiser wallowed through it. The ship was coming in at a shallow angle from low in the western sky, wreathed in smoke and fire as its shields struggled to stay up and ward off the hammering force of atmosphere. As they watched, a flicker and failure robbed the ship of what might have been an engine or something, which peeled off and corkscrewed away toward the south. No way is that thing surviving the hit, somebody opined. We'll check it out anyway. There's at least one human aboard, so we need to ID the body if not else, Powell replied. Legsy! Get the mules and one of the trucks started up. Send half the lads out there. Which truck, sir? I don't fucking care. The one with the broken mirror. He keyed his radio. Oi, Kirk. Hold off on escaping for now. Looks like we've got a couple of hours to check and see if Hot survives the crash. You may as well unload the colonists. There was a pause, and then the alien's simulated voice replied with a single professional word. Understood. Seconds later, the sanctuary emitted a dull thud that must have been its end of the jump array accepting an arrival. It was only the first of the ten that would deliver the first colonists and their equipment and effects to Cimbrian. Ten minutes later, 
Powell was riding shotgun in one of the mules as it bounced and skidded across fertile floodplains. The stream that ran through the palace grounds at Folkfa met up with a larger river, which in turn flowed out to the inland sea, from which a column of white smoke provided a clear marker as to the final resting place of the downed cruiser. The mules were half pickup truck, half quad bike, and quite capable of getting themselves out of damn near anything the terrain might snare them with, or, in the worst case, being physically hauled out by some strong men. Their supply of the diesel the little vehicles ran on was limited, but the development plan included finding a local plant species to refine into a biofuel. Besides, if anybody had survived the splashdown, the platoon needed to have men on the shore waiting to collect sooner rather than later, and the only way to get down there fast enough was by vehicle. They pulled themselves to a loam spraying halt as the sky flashed brilliantly from the direction of the sea. Every man in the mules in the truck flung themselves overboard and hit the dirt, half expecting a lethal shockwave to rampage up the valley and toss the vehicles flying, the product of some kind of nuclear meltdown or similar cataclysm. What instead arrived after too many tense heartbeats was a great echoing thunder of detonation that went on too long and was too gentle at that range to have been anything so apocalyptic. The fuck just happened? One of the seals asked, being the first to break the silence. Maybe it blew up, opined a Canadian SOR trooper. Better put paid to any survivors then, Powell said. Better hope not. We've still got a human to bag and tag. Man up. Let's get down there. Waves were still lapping the sands and pebbles when they halted on the beach, and not a moment too soon. A trio of what looked like cargo transports of some kind were hovering across the water, propelled by rowing of all things. A disheveled hulk of a man, all muscles, wild hair, wilder eyes, and umkent beard, splashed into the surf and waded ashore. He raised his hands in response to the guns that immediately aimed at him, but smiled. Good eye, he said. Folkfa Colony, Cimbrian, The Far Reaches. Powell's decision to order Kirk to remain had paid off, allowing the first civilian contractors and colonists to traverse the jump array from Earth. Already a team of determined-looking men were setting off into the forest with electric chainsaws, bent on constructing a log cabin to serve as a bunkhouse, as a rather more solid and permanent alternative to the tents of the military camp. Somehow, they had even managed to squeeze a tiny backhoe into the minuscule space available inside Sanctuary's end of the array, which was busily going to work laying the foundations for the bunkhouse and projects that would follow. Jen wondered where whichever government or governments were responsible for this whole plan had found civilians with the right skills who could be trusted with the secret, and were willing to take the risk. There must have been months of planning behind this venture at a bare minimum. Miss Jennifer Delaney, I presume? The voice had an accent that was pure southern England, reminding her vaguely of red tunics, flags, and old stone buildings. It belonged to a slim, earnest-looking man in his late middle age who extended a hand as they met. Just Jen? She asserted herself. Formality could go wrestle a vulza. She shook his hand, though, prompted by old Jen into remembering that preferring to be informal didn't mean needing to be rude. Jen it is, the newcomer agreed amicably. I'm Sir Jeremy Sandy, C.H., your replacement is governor here. Oh, thank goodness. That's a weight off my shoulders, Jen admitted. I've not done much governoring. I'm afraid I'm not cut out for desk work. No, indeed. You look like you'd find it bloody stifling, Sir Jeremy readily agreed. Jen found that she liked the man, despite the pomp and poshness in his accent, even if he was just very good indeed at reading people and saying what they wanted to hear. It was still nice to be charmed after months or, hell, years with no company but Adrian, herself, aliens, and a platoon of terrifyingly intense special forces. I can't help but notice you're about as English as the Queen, she said. Is Cimbrian a British colony now, or... The King, nowadays, Sir Jeremy revealed. But yes, it is. There was a lot of legal wrangling and courtroom drama involved, but... Ultimately, Britain successfully argued that because the colony's founder and first governor is a British national, as is its first military commander, he waved a hand, dismissively indicating what had surely been an extended and heated debate within the halls of power. Of course, that argument was much easier to make considering the confidential nature of the project. The absolute requirement of secrecy around Simrin's development stopped it from ballooning into the political row of the century. That makes sense, Jen considered. Well, it probably won't remain British for so very long. The Chinese, Argentinians, and Russians are all making uncomfortable noises about expansion and imperialism. Who knows, it could become the fifth member of the Union. 
or an overseas territory. But I think it more likely that Cimbrian will quietly, respectfully, and by common consent, go independent once on her feet and become a Commonwealth member. Assuming she survives, Jen pointed out, if the Great Hunt finds this place... We have a contingency prepared, Sir Jeremy assured her. In fact, you'll be pausing during your departure to deploy it. Oh, Kirk will explain. Let's just say that the need for absolute secrecy is going to be resolved soon. Among other things, a leak is inevitable, so we need to go public with the project sooner rather than later. So it can have a positive spin put on it? As you say, Sir Jeremy smiled. He looked around, drawing a deep and contented breath. Gosh, clean air. Clean, yes, but it's also a bit thin next to what you're used to. Don't exert yourself too hard at first, or you'll feel sick and shaky. Yes, I remember the briefing. Still, it's refreshing. I've spent months in offices in London and Toronto ahead of this assignment. Finally, being here is wonderful. You'll enjoy the night sky, Jen told him. There's no light pollution here, so you can see everything. I brought a telescope among my personal effects, Sir Jeremy admitted. I've always been something of an amateur... I've always been something of an amateur astronomer. The chance to survey new stars and constellations was part of what convinced me to take this commission. Well, we've got a couple of hours yet before the expedition gets back from investigating that crashed cruiser. So, welcome to Folkva. I'll give you the guided tour before we go. Delighted, Sir Jeremy exclaimed and took her arm. It was an avuncular, unconsciously friendly gesture, and Jen quite forgot to stiffen at the unexpected contact. Folkva, he asked. Jen smiled. There's a story behind that, she began. The enormous human wasn't quite aiming his weapon at Saunders, but then again, Guyotin doubted that he needed to. The squad of humans on the beach were quite plainly the most dangerous thing he had ever laid eyes on, each one of them comfortably wearing a harness of thick armor plating covered in a drab blend of greens and soil tones that his eyes almost wanted to skip off and treat as part of the background and a gun that the Gowan doubted he would even be able to lift. All bar the big one with the biggest gun were intimidatingly anonymous, their faces covered in black masks and with lenses of a brilliant orange over their eyes. He flopped onto the beach, growling at the pain in what was almost certainly a fractured bone high in his chest, and was surprised when one of the humans lowered his weapon and dashed over to him, unslinging from his back a bag of what were clearly medical supplies. It immediately became apparent that the human had no translator implant or technology on his person. But even in the curious cadences of an alien language, his tone of voice was reassuring and cheerfully optimistic as he drew a slim white cylinder from his pocket. Guyotin was in too much pain to really be too worried about a language barrier anyway, and just gratefully rested his head on the sand, awaiting his treatment. It came as a large disappointment when, muttering quietly to himself, the human scribbled a rune or letter of some kind on a piece of paper with the marker and pinned it to Guyotin's overalls before leaving and checking on a Coimbra crewman some ways down the beach. Guyotin was about to raise his voice in protest and demand to know whether the human felt that some curious ritual involving paper was going to mend a broken bone when the man simply touched the Kuumbara on one shivering flank reassuringly before checking on the next crewman without leaving a note or rune. This one received more attention and an injection from a small, presumably disposable, needle of some substance or other. It seemed to work, as the fallen crew member's pained noises rapidly subsided, to be replaced by an apparently gentle slumber. Triage, Guyotin realized, as the medic dashed from crewman to crewman, assessing the injuries. Mostly, he just repeated the action of labeling his patients, but here and there he administered injection of some drug or another. The unconscious human, Markovitz, was loaded onto a small ground vehicle which roared away in a spray of kicked-up sand. The mostly sane one, Kaminsky? was likewise loaded onto a vehicle, but this one was also occupied by a human who had the body language of the one in charge. They were just close enough for Guyotin's translator to decide it could hear the Russian's half of the conversation. The other didn't appear to have a translator of his own. Kaminsky, Roman, Spetsnaz, Captain. The other human spoke. The language was a staccato one, short, clipped consonants separated by long, broad vowel sounds punctuated halfway through by what was unmistakably a fucking. Guyotin still hadn't quite figured why humans referred to the act of copulation completely out of context so frequently, but he had come to recognize the word by sound. I understand, 
Our missions are at cross purposes. I had no idea the West had forces off-world. Gibberish. There was a questioning note at the end of that sentence. Of course. I surrender, Captain. The two Deathworlders gripped each other's hands firmly, and the Captain nodded, looking relieved. Babble? Nonsense? Thank you. Kaminsky glanced around and then leaned closer to the other human and spoke confidentially, too quietly for Gaiotin to overhear. The captain frowned, then turned to the enormous human with the giant gun. Legsy! Jabber, gobbledygook. The big one nodded sharply and then marched forward, stuck the vast weapon into the small of Adrian's back and ordered something. Yammer, fucking, prattle. Sure, mate. Whatever. Saunders agreed and started walking, placing his hands gently atop his head. Gaiotin wasn't sure if the easy, relaxed swagger in his movements was a symptom of bravado or honest insanity. He stopped paying attention when the human medic returned and extended a hand. Gaiotin took it with his good hand and was hauled, gently and respectfully, but with the inexorable force of a human's incredible strength, to his feet, offering words which, while Gaiotin couldn't understand them, promised medical attention and a future which didn't include eminent death. Maybe they aren't all completely crazy. Brick, New Jersey, Earth. Our first destination, after we had finally calmed Mikhail down and he had agreed not to reduce our abductors to a fine paste, was a Class Eleven world. I wish I knew its location, or anything more about it than its classification, but it was a pleasant place. Clement, warm weather, stunning scenery, gravity just a little lighter than Earth's. Atmospheric pressure just a little higher. I felt quite buoyant. Mikhail complained of the heat. Supposedly the world was home to a host of terrifying plagues, but neither of us ever got so much as a sniffle. Incompatibility with human biology, I suppose. Or maybe Earth's plagues are just nastier still. Who knows? Have you ever heard a Geiger counter in action? Many people are alarmed by how rapidly and often they click just in response to background radiation. That in itself really ought to be a clue as to how cruel a mother the Earth is, when you think about it. That the basic background level of radiation to which we are entirely accustomed seems excessive even to us when we first learn of it. Well, this planet, I suspected that it would only be the first of many which we visited, and so I named it Prathama, had a background radiation much lower than that of Earth. It was so low, in fact, that Mikhail and I both threatened that the counter was broken and requested replacements. The replacements corroborated the original, and in hindsight, why would an alien world have the same background radioactivity as Earth? It would hardly be an alien world if it was identical, would it? We had been dropped on this world and told to search the area. Given who we were and the equipment our employer had granted us, it wasn't hard to put together that we were searching for fallout zones. But what wasn't clear was why. Death worlds, after all, are supposed to be uninhabited. Humanity, we are told, is a lone statistical anomaly, the one race to defy the odds. If that were true, and if space-faring sofans avoid death worlds out of sensible caution, then why would there be any evidence of nuclear catastrophe on the surface of such a world? Folktha, Cimbrian. A cry of, They're coming back! echoed across the camp. Sir Jeremy turned to his predecessor as Cimbrian's colonial governor and extended a hand. Best of luck, Jen, he said. And you, Sir Jeremy, she replied, shaking it. Enjoy the paperwork? You can call me Jeremy, he allowed. I'll make sure to have the bath enclosed and hooked up to hot water. You'll always be welcome here. She smiled. Thanks. A quick check showed that the truck was picking its way down the hillside. They had only a few minutes until the survivors from the ship reached the camp, and neither Jen nor Kirk had any intention of being identified as having been present. I'd better run. Before you go, Sir Jeremy rummaged in his pocket and produced a folded envelope. This is from the Prime Minister. He would like you to do something more for Earth. I suspect you'll find it more to your liking than governoring. Oh? You'll have your own spaceship for a start. Read it as you go. I'll do that. See you when I see you, Jeremy. They shook hands and she ran sure-footed across the palace rubble and across the open field, up the sanctuary's ramp, which closed behind her. Just in time, Kirk said. 
I was about to leave you. Sanctuary's engines heaved, and she popped up and was gone in a startlingly short space of time, inertial compensation making the whole exercise feel eerily detached from the way the ground retreated and curled at the edges in short order. Jen's last glimpse of Folktha was when the camo field snapped on below them, obscuring the vehicles just before they entered the camp. They paused when Cimbrian itself was nothing more than a distant crescent sliver of blue-white, so small that she could have covered it with a pinhead at arm's length, and Sanctuary pulsed once as Kirk fired into orbit around the star. What was that? she asked. System defense field, Kirk said. A little modified. The colonists brought it back from Scotch Creek with them. Oh, a whole system? Like the one around Earth? Very similar, Kirk agreed except that we can turn this one off when we want to. Jen said nothing, and pulled the letter from her pocket. She was half through rereading it, when Kirk interrupted her thoughts. Ready to go FTL, he informed her. Where would you like to go? Erbzerk. How are they doing? The colony's newly arrived doctor was an American, Dr. Martin Adams, and had undergone intensive training in non-human anatomy and medicine as a precaution. He had, to put it mildly, been surprised as all hell to have to practice his skills the instant he arrived. He and Powell had met briefly during the preliminary phases of the colony operation, and he had the intense, competent air of somebody who threw themselves completely into their work. One of the Vizcatics died, he reported. Not much we could do for her. The rest, well, I've set their bones, cleaned and dressed their wounds, and made them comfortable. But they just don't heal as fast as we do. Some of them are going to be in here for a long while. Frankly, it's a good thing we all have those disease suppression implants or they'd be in serious trouble already. And the Spetsnaz? Powell asked him. Kaminsky's basically fine. I've got his arm plastered and a big glass of water sorted out the last of that pixie dust stuff. There's nothing I can do for the other guy, though. I got an IV in him, but if or when he pulls through is out of my hands, Captain. Frankly, he needs to go back to Earth. There's only Ride just left, too. All right, keep me posted. For now, I want a word with our P.O.W. He's over there. Dr. Adams jerked a thumb to a bed with the curtains drawn. Knock yourself out. Kaminsky was sitting up in his cot, looking bored. The man standing guard over the prisoner was a valuable resource kept from doing something more constructive, Powell knew. Hopefully, Kaminsky would turn out to be cooperative, and his warder could be returned to a useful assignment. Russian was a language that still formed an important part of the modern British Special Forces soldier curriculum but he knew only a few key phrases. Still, it seemed only polite to use them. Cock dealer, Captain, he asked. Kaminsky's English wasn't perfect and was heavily accented, but was a damn sight better than Powell's Russian. The translator implants he had received from the Alliance were useless. Powell didn't have a matching set for them to talk with. Still, he might come in handy as an interpreter for the alien prisoners. Better, the Spetsnaz captain replied. I could do with vodka, though. Several vodkas? You lost men on that ship? Powell asked. Da. Sorry. Yes, I did. To traps, ambushes, maybe to that fucking foam. Kaminsky indicated the dormant form of Markovitz, then to an empty cot opposite his own. Sit down, he invited. Powell did so. So I want to strike a deal, mate, he said. Kaminsky looked interested. What deal? If I have to, I'll need to assign a guard to you at all times. And I've got fucking precious few men to waste on that duty. You can see how a Russian special forces trooper smack in the middle of my mission is a bit of a sticky wicket. I see that. So, do I have to? What is your offer? Kaminsky asked carefully. Quid pro quo, mate. A little information and I might be persuaded you're going to behave yourself and I can put Private Hoda there back to work. Where I'm from, my interrogation would not be so pleasant. Kaminsky joked. Been there, fucking done that, Powell told him. But I don't see the need to start with threats and pain, when you and I can just come to an officer's agreement, Mike. I agree. It is better this way, Kaminsky said. But are you asking about this spaceship and how I came to be on it? Or about my Australian friend with the alien mutant juice? Alien mutant juice. Powell's tone of voice was a flat repetition, but also a question. Just something he said, and my suspicions... I'll tell you first one story, then the other, yes? Powell acquiesced with a bobble of his head and a shrug. Sounds fair. He listened. 
Kaminsky's life had rapidly swung for the strange the second he had encountered the now-crashed cruiser, moving from a relative cakewalk to a desperate fight to survive. All things considered, that the man had escaped only with some mild poisoning and a broken ulna to show for it was impressive. Whether out of soldierly efficiency, Russian brevity, or simple terseness from being a slightly hesitant Anglophone, Roman's account didn't take long. They sat, considering the implications for a while. Finally, Powell stood up and shook the Spetsnaz officer's hand. I have your word you'll be safe, he said. I would like to go home as soon as possible, Kaminsky confessed. I think betraying your trust would only delay that. Good enough for me, Powell said, then deployed some of his own meager Russian again. Spasibu za informatio. Kaminsky smiled. Nostrovia, he said. Good luck with this Australian. He's crazy. Brick, New Jersey. Earth. We had grown so accustomed to the sporadic background noise of our counter that when it ticked up to what was by any human standard merely a healthy background, we both became quite fretful and uncertain. Our trepidation was not without good reason, it must be said. The difference between a perfectly safe exposure and rapid but unpleasant death could just be whatever it is that you're standing behind at the moment. From that moment on, we moved carefully. We tested the water, kept some clean in a bottle to wash out any fallout from our persons if we should be contaminated, paused every few hundred meters to probe the air, the soil, and the plants for contaminants. And we found them. Oh yes, isotope concentrations in the soil, all from uranium's decay chain, signs of heavy metal poisoning in the local wildlife, including one unfortunate predator that must have had a vast concentration in its equivalent of a liver, concentrated into it by its food chain. It was lying, dying, by the side of the first sign of civilization we had seen, a road. Folk the Colony Cimbrian, the far reaches. Adrian Saunders turned out to be huge. It had to be Saunders, even though Jen had been perfectly convinced he was dead. Even without knowing the first name, there were no other Australians with engineering experience and military training on the abductee list. The guy wasn't tall. In fact, Powell had a good couple of inches on him. But he made up for it by plainly having the kind of physique that strongman competitors and bodybuilders beat themselves up in pursuing. It looked like working muscle, too, rather than pure steroidal bulk. He let the man stew for a few minutes as he sorted out some paperwork, including a quick reread of Saunders' file. When he judged that his prisoner was about on the verge of starting to fidget, he looked up and gave him his well-practice, I really don't have time to deal with this shit, so you damn well better impress me look. Contrary to the usual response, Saunders instead smirked and laughed slightly. I'm not finding this fucking funny. Powell snapped shutting the man up even if the response was more arrogantly sullen than alarmed. Do you have any idea what kind of problems you've caused just by being here? If you are who I think you are, you're doing a shite job of being dead. And if I am who I think I am, you should have a long fucking think before making it known. Saunders retorted, though why he felt that should be the case was a mystery from Powell's perspective. Where's Jennifer Delaney? You don't ask questions, Powell told him. You answer them. This earned another insubordinate frown. Frankly, it was amazing the man had made any kind of a career in the military at all. His body language and defiant expression was more rebellious teenager than professional soldier. You bastards just shot down my ship. He began to protest. Powell interrupted him, not in the mood to let the prisoner claim the initiative. Captain Kaminsky tells me it was a pirate vessel, and that you only boarded it once he'd taken control of it. He said, in fact, he's told me a lot of interesting things about you. Saunders gave a dismissive shrug. So I'm the one who stole it most recently. I'm still the guy who crash-landed a starship on a planet and walked away. And that's not even close to the most fucking terrifying thing I've done this week. Powell had once led a team which infiltrated a jihadist compound specifically to stab one man and steal his notebook, then exfiltrated with the entire camp hunting for them. That had taken skill, courage, and no small amount of daring. Surviving a water landing in a starship, especially a badly damaged one, smacked more of luck, and luck in his experience was not to be relied upon, nor boasted about. Not fucking impressed, mate, he said. This dismissal seemed to score a hit because Saunders shifted forward angrily and raised his voice, apparently oblivious to the five guns that all snapped to aim directly at him. 
and the way Powell's hand dropped to his holstered sidearm. I've just been in a merry jaunt through fucking hell, he snarled, and all I want is the answer to one goddamned question. Powell let the moment of tension play out, until Saunders calmed down a bit and sat back. The angry shouting approach hadn't worked, forcing him into a more reciprocal, reasonable approach. Please, he asked, eventually settling down. Powell kept his satisfaction from showing, and instead made a show of standing down in turn, as did his men. Quid pro quo, then, he said. You answer my questions, and I'll answer what I can of yours. Something tells me neither of us is going to like the answers. No fucking kidding, Adrian asked. Well, I haven't liked much for as long as I can remember, so why the fuck should I start now? Where's Jennifer Delaney? First, Powell persisted, your name... He gave it a moment, then when no answer seemed forthcoming, he decided to say it outright. You are... Adrian? The captive interrupted, jerking a thumb towards the soldiers. You better trust these fuckers here implicitly, if you're going to finish that sentence. Or maybe, we can just assume that whatever you were going to say is right. Powell gave him a cool stare. Of course he trusted them implicitly. This was a top-secret mission, and the men under his command were the best of the best. Not a single one of them was a security liability. Besides, whatever reasons the man felt he had for needing to keep his secret superhero identity, and Powell wasn't about to rule out some kind of paranoid delusion, he hadn't yet revealed what they might be. Powell wasn't interested in playing interstellar man of mystery. Saunders, he finished. As for Miss Delaney. No, now I'm now I'm Adrian as well as Saunders, he finished. Saunders, he finished. As for Miss Delaney. You just missed her. She shipped out when we detected your mob coming in. There was a long, bewildered pause, and then the Australian broke down and started laughing. It wasn't a happy laugh. It was a black, cynical one. The laugh of a man who'd just figured out that he was the butt of a sadistic sense of humor. Of course. Of course she did. He exclaimed, somewhere between the laughing and the sobs. Gone home, I bet. No reason to wait for a dead man. Jesus fucking Christ. Powell decided as the Australian slowly pulled himself together not to correct him on that point. Jen had clearly been holding a torch for this guy, but mental cases like this tended to be a danger to themselves and anybody nearby. Jen was too competent, capable, and useful a resource to endanger like that. Kaminsky wasn't bloody kidding, he declared. Is the rest true? The infrared? The muscles? Adrian nodded as he ran a rough hand through his beard and across his head. Yep, he said, voice still trembling. But I wouldn't fucking recommend it. How are the Russians doing? Quid pro quo, remember? True enough. Kaminsky's recovered. We have no idea what's wrong with Markovich outside of pixie dust. Something to do with the alien fire suppressant. Apparently it sends you totally fucking mental before you go catatonic. At least, that's what I've gathered from it. Saunders revealed. I'd stay away from that shit if I were you. No shit, Powell thought, feeling that his intelligence was being insulted. Who did this idiot think he was dealing with? There wasn't a soldier on Symbrian who wasn't veteran special forces. They didn't need advice from a crazed resurrectee. They needed the facts, unbiased and plain. Shit like don't breathe in the toxic foam went without saying. He kept his cool by changing the subject. You're a wanted man on Earth, you know, he told him keeping his tone light and companionable. By rights, we're supposed to imprison you and keep you until we can send you back. But, he looked the Australian up and down. I can smell the kind of shit you're in, and I'm not going to put this colony and my mission at risk over a dropout who's legally fucking dead. He said, Do you know how long that paperwork takes? I don't have the fucking time nor the inclination, so long as you promise to get the fuck out of my hair and never come back. Spread the word there's not but ruins on Cimbrian. Spread the word there's not but ruins on Cimbrian. And I might even be persuaded to see if there's aught useful you can be doing instead of stealing pirate ships and chasing after a girl who's got her shit together way better than you do. They stared at each other for a few moments. Then Adrian unclenched his fists, sighed, and nodded. Looks like you've still got some broken down old ships. I can probably put a working one together given a bit of time. A week, two at most. And then I'll be out of your hair, he offered. Good, Powell said. Anything to get the man away from the colony and back out into the wider galaxy where he could do less harm. We'll give you food, 
clothes and shelter, and a fucking shave if you want it. But you need to get out of here before you become a problem. And for the moment, Captain, he added, stressing Saunders' former rank, you are going to give me a full debriefing. He listened as the disgrace seated opposite him relented and launched into a characteristically foul-mouthed summary of everything that had happened to him since his abduction. What was clear was that Adrian Saunders was completely out of his gourd and a danger to both himself and to everybody around him. He briefly entertained the thought of just shooting the dangerous Pratt then and there and giving him a grave somewhere in the Folk the Palace grounds. It would certainly have been the most expedient solution. And when it came down to it, the SBS had done a lot worse during their history for the sake of the mission than putting down a figurative rabid dog. It wasn't a choice between pragmatism and compassion so much as a choice between conflicting forms of pragmatism, really. In the end, letting him live one out. Getting the word spread that Cimbrian was uninhabited might just put paid to the rumors of a colonial effort that had lured Sanders here in the first place. Not to mention that having the man sighted a long way from here could only increase the colony's security, next to the trail going cold on its way here. Besides, if he kept taking crazy risks, then eventually his luck or tenacity would run out, and that would be the end of it. The fucking dinosaurs built a spaceship, he said flatly. It wasn't a question so much as a simple statement of disbelief. Yep, Saunders said it with his apparently trademark, I couldn't give a fuck even if somebody else did all the heavy lifting attitude, but also with the total assurance of somebody who knew that what they were saying was absurd, and yet sincerely believed it to be the truth. I asked for a fucking debriefing, not a flight of fancy. Space dragons, fucking X-File Grey's aliens, blue giraffes, raccoon people, and yep, the dinosaurs built a fucking spaceship. Not my fault the universe is totally fucking mental. Saunders objected. He sniffed and added, Fucking good spaceship, too. Powell sat back and considered as Saunders rambled on at length about Saurian robotic terminators, stasis chambers, the trouble with blue fur, statues, collapsing buildings, missile riding, Volza riding, and how much he hated fire suppressant, black holes, and Dara Houston. The whole monologue was being recorded for transmission back to Earth. How much of it was true or even plausible wasn't a matter he intended to waste much time or thought on. But he did notice that while Saunders mentioned something called the hierarchy a couple of times, he didn't elaborate on who or what said hierarchy might be. When it came up again, he finally had to interrupt. Okay, that's the third fucking time you've mentioned this hierarchy. Who in the hell are they meant to be? He demanded. Saunders had the good grace to look embarrassed. Long and short of it, they're the space Illuminati. For fuck's sake. Powell exploded to his feet, spun away from the desk and pinched the bridge of his nose as he stood facing the corner for a second. Head bowed. I have no idea why I don't just assume you're taking the piss. He muttered. I know a few things. They're beyond cutting edge. They've got a fucking army and they love robots. Oh, and they can copy their brains away. Great, Powell muttered. He turned and considered things. Bloody hell. Why in God's name do I believe you, Saunders? Don't fucking ask me. The Australian gave him a wild-eyed shrug. I hardly believe all this shit, but you do have a crashed hierarchy ship sitting offshore. Not like I can do aught with it. Powell grumbled as he sat down again. Nobody on his team was even remotely qualified to handle, salvage, or work with non-human technology. A critical mission oversight in retrospect. And here I thought this debriefing was going to make my job less fucking difficult, he mused. Adrian shrugged. You can't, he said. Powell, distracted by his own thoughts, didn't catch the inflection properly. Can't? What now? He asked. You can't do anything with it. I probably can, Adrian repeated. My lads and the seals could dive that wreck no problem, but we wouldn't know the warp engine from the shitter, Powell said. You saying you would? Ari built a dinosaur spaceship and killed a fleet of fucking assholes with it, Saunders boasted, looking as if he was regaining a degree of focus. There was a hint of the once professional soldier in the way he spoke. I'm not saying it's recoverable, but if it is... Powell considered scratching his own facial hair. If it is, you might actually turn out not to be a complete fucking liability after all, he acknowledged. Saunders' professionalism slipped again, and there was a certain manic glint in his eye that only reinforced Powell's conviction that he belonged as far away from Cimbrian as possible if the colony was to succeed. I was going to take some hard fucking revenge on these fuckers anyway, so, you know, it's no problem, he said. Powell weighed his options. Unstable though he was, Saunders was the only man to hand who had the knowledge and experience necessary to do anything with the crashed, 
Hierarchy ship before the salt water completely ruined it. And if they were as dangerous as he suggested, then his mission demanded at least sweeping the thing for tracking devices, beacons, or other potential mission compromisers. Not to mention intelligence of a long-term threat. Fine, he relented. You get to dive that wreck. You find any intel we can use and turn it over, and I might even drop the whole never come back thing. I'm still kicking you off this planet, because I need trouble like you a long way away from my mission. But if you can prove you're not a complete cock-up, and turn up all this useful, and rip out and destroy anything that might lead the hierarchy this way, well, there's the deal. Honestly, I doubt it even has what I want, Adrian confessed, but I'll be sure to look. What about after I've left? You got a phone number? Next best thing, Powell said. You know Star Trek? Yeah, my old man had an obsession. Good. Then you should remember this. There's an agent we use. He handles courier work, messages and odd jobs for us. He's got an interstellar data net drop box. If you have a message for us, send it there and he'll pass it on. The address is November Charlie Charlie, 1701. Got that? Got it. Saunders nodded, the soldier showing again for a second, in the attentive way he gave his undivided attention to the important information. You know how to stay secure online? I have a guy who can crack cybersecurity like an egg, Adrian reassured him. You trust him? We've seen a lot of shit together, so you know how it is. I know he's not hierarchy. That would have been good enough for Powell had the Australian been talking about a fellow human, but only one name in the story he had just told fit the description. You don't mean this Askit bloke, do you? I thought you said he was a Cortai. Trusting a Cortai with valuable information was, as far as the analysts back on Earth had been concerned, about the same thing as trying to carry boiling oil in a colander. The only way it could end was you getting burned. You only told them secrets if you wanted those secrets to fall into enemy hands. He is, Adrian acknowledged. And I've almost never wanted to kill him. Whatever, Powell sighed. I guess trusting you with this means trusting whoever you trust in turn. Just don't send in the clear and use a code name. Kirk, Enterprise, and Federation are already taken. Got that? Adrian considered, and then an impish grin parted his beard. Reckon I might go with Captain Scarlet. Looks like I'm breaking the theme. If playing the fucking special snowflake is what folks your cock, sure. Whatever. Powell told him. Got anything more to add before I let you bugger off and start building your pet starship? Just one thing, Adrian replied, shifting forward in his seat. I'm about to start waging my own personal fucking war on an enemy I can't even imagine. If you've got a wish list for souvenirs, just let me know. He wasn't engaging his brain, or else that list should have been obvious. But then again, Powell knew the value of repeating things in case something had been overlooked. Anything that proves they exist and aren't just your imagination, he said, extending his fingers to list the items he could think of. Bleeding edge technology, alien hard drives, journals... Logbooks, computers, that sort of thing. A working cloaking device, or at least one that's not too badly broken. Maps, encryption keys, intel, basically. You need a cloaking device? Saunders asked, sounding faintly incredulous. He waved his arm vaguely toward the tent wall, indicating the unseen crashed starships outside. You've got half a dozen wrecked Hunter ships lying all over the place. Bloody lovely, Powell agreed. Now if you can point out which bit of the fucking things is the cloaking device... I might consider it a tick in the not-a-complete-waste-of-space column. Saunders scowled. Your confidence is fucking overwhelming, he grumbled. I'll put it on the list of shit I have to do. Saunders, Powell warned. As far as I'm concerned, the one thing that makes you worth the oxygen you're breathing is that you're the only bastard on this planet right now who knows a spaceship's ass from its elbow. He looked Adrian dead in the slightly crazed eye. Remember that, eh? The intimidation tactics didn't seem to work. Saunders seemed to take it more as a joke than as a reminder of just how tenuous his position was, and grinned. I'll remember, he promised. Right. Powell nodded upwards towards the door, dismissing the man. Fuck off. Alright guys, that's where I'm going to stop it for today. This one is already an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, holy shit, my throat hurts, and so does my fucking nose. Jesus Christ. These chapters are going to be like two fucking hours long, you guys. I'm going to have to break them down. Oh my god. Alright, well thank you so much for listening today. This, by the way, for those listening to the stream, is just the sign-off that I'm doing for the end of this part of the chapter. Um, Thank you so much for watching, and uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye guys. Thanks.
Oh, and remember to comment, subscribe, uh, 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 touch, touch the like button, touch tips with the like button. And then, um, that's all I got. Yeah. Touch tips with the like button. Bye.